This is the story of the gateway to the West. This is the story of the St. Louis Arch. The United States has dozens of iconic landmarks, all featuring a type of against the odds quality. Take the Golden Gate Bridge, a beautiful suspension bridge that was once dismissed as being mechanically impossible. Or the Empire State Building, one of the most prolific skyscrapers in the world, overshadowing everything that stood before it. And of course, we have the Statue of Liberty, a beacon of hope and the very symbol of freedom. However, today we will discover a somewhat overlooked structure in Missouri, a grand silver arch, symbolic of the nation's primary motives for independence. As the population began migrating into the suburbs, St. Louis started to look for a way to enhance its legacy in the country's eyes. So a citizens committee decided to sponsor a competition of architects tasked to build a monument for the pioneers that made St. Louis what it was. The winner would get the honor of designing the structure and an additional $225,000 cash prize. The competition's judges consisted of many prolific architects brought together to choose five semifinalists out of 172 entries. One of these five semifinalists was a man named Irno Saarinen. His design was a 630 foot tall arch made of stainless steel, weighing 43,226 tons, which would eventually be associated with St. Louis for the years to come. He officially won the competition on February the 18th, 1948. And not long after, the arch would be dubbed the Gateway Arch to the West in homage to the Oregon Trail. Sadly, the competition winner would not live on to see his gateway open. On September the 1st, 1961, he passed, losing his battle with brain cancer. And despite the loss, the plans were already several years underway and would continue without its creator. With construction commencing in 1963, making these designs a reality was much easier said than done. In fact, some thought it would be impossible. The two arch bases were constructed separately, with stainless steel pieces built in Pennsylvania being lowered one by one into the iconic shape that defines the St. Louis skyline. The curvature of every detail had to be perfect and placed with perfection. If they were off by even a millimeter, the whole structure would have come tumbling down, ruining many years of work. The task of structural design fell to Fred Severed, who laid out his plans in exact detail, but the following was recalled by his son Fred Jr. The arch was too tall for standard cranes, so the crew placed cranes that climbed along the arch on each leg. At 500 feet, a beam was put between these two so-called climbing cranes, granting them the strength of the inward curve. Forming the curve was yet another struggle. As it got steeper and steeper, the construction workers became increasingly concerned that a piece would be misplaced ever so slightly, which would have doomed the project. The architects spent hours running through countless mathematical formulas to make sure that their placements were correct. Pittsburgh Des Moines Steel, which built all of the arch's pieces, actually ran a computer check to reassure their calculations and found no mistakes. Even with all the math behind them, the final stretch was the most terrifying challenge. The construction team was concerned if the space they had left at the top would fit. No matter if by too much or too little, any amount misplaced would mean that the whole structure could fall, as the balance was fragile. Not to mention, the day they had set for planting the last piece had warm weather. Since the arch was so huge, the legs had different exposures to heat, which caused them to differ by several feet. The team eventually opted to place the last piece at night, since the equal heat made the signs line up properly. However, this decision faced fierce objection from the mayor of St. Louis, who believed that the historic moment shouldn't be relegated to some after dark happening, that it needed to happen in the early afternoon where everyone could bear witness. Initially, this seemed to be a significant impasse until designers came up with a solution. They realized that by soaking the hot side in water, the arch would contract, making the structure even and safe to place the last piece. So they got the local fire chief on board who provided the necessary hoses and equipment to spray it down. And the team achieved their historic moment on October the 28th, 1965 opening the gateway to the west in perfection. However, there was still one problem after assembly was complete. How could visitors travel to the top 
of this bizarrely shaped structure. Anyone familiar with the St. Louis Gateway Arch knows that visitors can enter the structure and peer out of viewports at the top, but the curve of the arch would seem to rule out an elevator as a way to access the observation deck, or at least that was the case until Dick Bowser, a man who worked for the Montgomery Elevator Company, had something to say on the matter. Dick designed a capsule that rotated as it ascended a track, kind of like a Ferris wheel. The team deployed many models and prototypes to ensure that children and adults of all sizes could make it to the top safely and enjoyably. Thus, the Gateway to the West opened on June the 10th, 1967, drawing the years of construction to a close, and despite estimates predicting that the project would cost 13 of the hundreds of workers their life, everyone walked off the building site alive and well. The whole project cost $13.4 million and continues to strike awe into its 3.5 million annual visitors as one of America's modern wonders. And with such an unusual monument, you're probably wondering if anyone has attempted any stunts on site. Well, the answer is yes. So before we go, let me share a few of their stories. On June the 22nd, 1966, citizens of St. Louis observed a prop plane fly right under the Gateway Arch. Those inside claimed to have felt the entire structure shake from the turbulence created by the aircraft. Amazingly, authorities never found the pilot, and it wasn't until 50 years later that Donna Doris, aged 75, fessed up about her father, Earl Bullen's stunt. Apparently, he flew as a hobbyist and never spoke of his crime publicly. According to DustyOldThing.com, a total of 11 people have flown aircraft, including a helicopter, under the arch as of 2016, and most were never caught. According to Architectural Digest, in 1980, Daredevil Kenneth Swire set out on an insane mission to skydive out of an airplane, land on the Gateway Arch, cut loose his opened parachute, and then base jumped to the ground below. Unfortunately, his second parachute failed to open, and Kenneth died upon impact. There were additional illegal base jumps, such as the one committed by John Vincent on September the 14th, 1992. Having survived the ordeal, Vincent pled guilty to charges and was sentenced to a $1,000 fine, 25 hours of community service, and one year of probation. Unfortunately, the daredevil didn't manage the terms of his probation, and a judge sent him to jail for 90 days, quoting that Mr. Vincent had a serious attitude problem. 